Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by Cars.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Hello, everyone, and welcome to MotorWeek podcast number 14. Glad to have you with us. And I'm joined today by our reporter for our FYI segment, Yolanda Vasquez. Hello there. Our road test producer, Brian Robinson. That's me. Hello. And our associate producer and all-around uh, jack-of-all-trades, Ben Davis. <laughs> Hi. How are you guys doing? No relation to me, luckily for him. <laughs> uh, we're going to try something later in today's podcast that we've never done before. We're going to call it uh, our MotorWeek lightning round. We'll give our panelists and myself two minutes to kind of crawl all over each other about their point of view on a, a topic that's uh, creating a lot of buzz. But first, we're going to do what we normally do on one of our podcasts and bring you up to date on some of our inside chatter on different events and the latest cars that we've tested. Yolanda, you and I have been involved in reporting on the uh, New York International Auto Show, the last big auto show of the auto show season. Um Give me an idea when you were basically putting together the script and the motor news. Did anything pop out at you that was a real surprise that you weren't expecting? Well, John, there's always lots to show and tell at the New York International Auto Show, but the biggie this year has to do with the Puma. We're not talking about sneakers. We're talking about the personal urban mobility and accessibility vehicle. Now, this is a Mm two-seat prototype. It's an electric vehicle that was developed by General Motors and Segway, and it's probably something that's going to be used for a lot of urban settings. I think it'll be ideal in a lot of campus settings or perhaps somewhere like in the National Mall in D.C. And this was quite a looker at the New York Auto Show. You're you're absolutely right. To set the stage for this, imagine a rickshaw, but without anybody pulling it. And it had two people on the inside. It had a steering wheel. So unlike the segways that you see running around the airports, there you didn't lean forward and back, but you pushed the wheel, which looked very much like it was on uh, the same kind of stock that you would find in an airplane, forward and back and the floor actually moved from out under you, and that created the balance that allowed this vehicle to go forward and back, and then you turn the wheel to go around corners. It was pretty cool. It's, I guess, you know, you'd say, is it real? Uh, GM and Segway were both saying, you know, we don't know. There's nothing that would keep us from buying it. The technology's there. Um, Cost could be a problem. It might be, they were saying, a third to a half what a car is. So does that mean it's... Six, seven, eight thousand dollars. Would you pay for that? Right. When you could pay just a little bit more for perhaps a subcompact vehicle that you could drive out to the Hamptons or something on the weekend. Sure. But it was really cool, and it was something that was unexpected. Anybody else have? So you, everybody, I'm sure saw some of the pictures of it. Quite wild. I'm still kind of taking it all in. I'm starting to picture it in my mind. I didn't. I haven't seen it. So uh, yeah. It was. It was. Uh, it actually had a tiny little roof over it. But I mean, it was basically unusual. But beyond beyond that. There were some small car news, wasn't there? Well, smaller is the theme for the New York Auto Show, indeed, at least the ones that we were able to take a look at. And we're talking about Scion's IQ concept. And this is sort of a a, a different version of Toyota's uh, tiny Mm three-seater that includes the uh, airbag and, you know, uh, uh, rear collision. So this is something that also is, is, you know, quite a looker at well as well at the New York Auto Show. This is their version of something to counter the Smart 4-2. And everybody, except it actually does carry a third person. You can put uh, a small person in the back. and there's A very little, small person. A very small it's very person. tiny. It's very tiny. There's been a lot of criticism that some of these tiny little cars like the Smart might not do well in a rear collision, although they do okay on the test. So they actually have this rear window airbag, and it's the first time any car's had something like that. So if you get hit in the back, because there's not a lot of body structure there. Mm. You'll have some extra protection. No word if they're going to bring it in, but I'm sure they probably will. And no word on pricing, too, since we don't know if it's coming in. No, but I would expect it'll probably be the, the least expensive uh, Scion out there. Uh, there were the, the one thing that struck me about the show, I spent like three days roaming the halls, and it was more like an ordinary auto show than the ones we've seen in Detroit and Chicago. There, there weren't a lot of empty spaces. Most of the automakers were there. Uh, Nissan, who had not been at Detroit, was there with a, a big display. So and it had a bit more of an up attitude uh, than some of the auto shows we've been to this spring. Uh, there was, you know, a fair selection of new cars and new trucks, uh, new Subaru Legacy, uh, something from GMC called the Terrain, a five-passenger uh, uh, crossover utility with 30-mile-per-gallon fuel economy, uh, which is pretty pretty good for a mid-sized uh, vehicle like that. 
And uh, generally speaking, it was more upbeat, and we can only hope that maybe it means uh, sales might turn around. Absolutely. Okay, thanks, Yolanda. Brian Robinson, one of the most anticipated new vehicles for the last three years, and you finally got to drive it, the Chevy Camaro. Was it worth the wait? Well, let me preface all comments with the fact that I'm a Mustang owner. (laughs) I, I love Mustangs. But having said that, the Camaro pretty much kicks the Mustang's uh, arse, if I can say that on a podcast. I'm not sure. But as much as it hurts me to say it, it's the case. Uh, just starting with engines, the V6 is over 300 horsepower wow. compared to the Mustang. That's the standard motor. Correct. Right. Uh, compared to the Mustang's, like 210, I think, and the V8, uh, 426 horsepower, huge. And the fuel economy numbers are almost exactly the same as the Mustang with all that additional power. Even a little better in a couple of things. Then you throw in independent rear suspension. The car drives amazingly well. Uh, it's comfortable. Yeah. Talk about styling. Uh, similar to the Mustang, kind of retro. Not super retro, but... Uh, and also, like the Mustang, the rear end is kind of where it gets a little chunky and not as attractive. But it looks much tougher in person than the pictures. What, what do you think about the interior? They've gone back using those retro squarish and, and rectangular yeah. gauges that we used to see on Camaros and Firebirds. I yeah, I, love the, I like the interior a lot. It's really? probably my favorite. Uh, really? Yeah. And uh, Ben, you too. I loved them, Ben. I, I love them now. I, I wonder if that's an, an age thing. That's interesting. Yeah. So you really thought that was super cool? Absolutely. Wait, are you saying that you didn't love them? <laughs> I, I really didn't. I, I thought, I think they, you know, the, the car itself has a lot of sharp to it, but when you looked at modern is more rounded and less square. It's it's rounded with creases. These are rectangulars, and I didn't think it fit the outside as much, but that's very interesting because, uh, you know, obviously it was tuned towards two people, people that owned Camaros and probably Firebirds, which I did not. I was a Mustang owner, too, <laughs> and um, and a younger class of uh, folks, which you all represent and I don't. So, Well, yeah, I think that was part of their thing. They think the majority of the buyers are not going to be into the nostalgia at all. Right. They're, they want to car that gets good gas mileage it's entertaining to drive every day i mean even when you go back to the 60s muscle car eras the majority of the cars sold were v6 right. daily drivers right. they weren't they weren't the big v8 horsepower things that we like to remember i mean it's a daily driver kind of car now i mean what did we call them back then you wouldn't remember but i will tell you uh-huh. we used to refer to them as secretary secretary's cars uh-huh. Because basically, uh, that's you know, you used to see a lot of young single women driving them, and that's yeah. what they could afford yeah. because of insurance and everything else. And there were a lot of them. I had an old Mustang that uh, near the gas pedal had a round rubber uh, disc for high heeled shoes to keep no wear kidding. through the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was a, it was a dealer add on. Now, that's what Still I should have been looking for back in the day. Okay, <laughs> I missed my calling. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Ben, um, yes. not really a competitor to the Camaro, but I think it's going to be. Compared to the Camaro, and that's the new Hyundai Genesis Coupe. Tell sure, us about absolutely. It. It'll probably be compared to the uh, Mustang GT as well. Um, they targeted the G37 as a benchmark, and it very much resembles that car and um, in the similar handling characteristics. I had the immense pleasure of driving uh, the car on a closed road course out just outside of Vegas. I drove the six cylinder and the turbo. And um, it's amazing how each engine really changes the whole entire characteristics of the car. It's, uh, they're both Genesis Coupes, but the four-cylinder, you have uh, spooled-up turbo coming out of the corners. It just You squirt the power on. It's, an, it's a totally different car than the six, which is more along the lines of a Mustang GT kind of feel. So you like the four-cylinder as a, as a track car or as a performance car better? I do. I think, it, I mean, the U.S. has not had a... F- a uh, four-cylinder rear-wheel drive car to choose from since the Nissan 240SX. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that it's it's been a long time coming, and the tuners are going to embrace it and and build it up and turn it into the perfect uh, weekend track car slash uh, performance uh, handler. Yeah, I guess there's been a, there has been a few other four-cylinder coupes, right? And BMW, not rear-wheel so drive, not rear. Well, BMW, the three, the early three series. Anyway, but the thing is, there's nothing else out there like it right now. Yeah, since the early 90s. So do you think as a second car in the Genesis lineup, it makes sense? Um, You know, Genesis is supposed to be this up-level brand or brand within a brand for Hyundai. I think it does make sense. 
Um, I'm glad to see it. it. There's definitely a market for it, I believe. It's an interesting looking car. It looks a little bit more. It looks a little bit Tiburon-ish yeah. to me. Not, yeah, I'm okay. surprised that yeah. it's not wearing a Tiburon nameplate. It, yeah. it really does look Tiburon. But the Tiburon being front so would, drive, I guess. Would you, you buy the four-cylinder or the six? Which would you, what would you buy? I like the I like the Mustang GT-esque feel of the six-cylinder. So I would probably buy the six. But I can, at a $22,000 base price for the four, I would definitely. And there's a lot of talk four. about the four being campaigned, being a you know, weekend racer. Yeah, and you can buy it with a track package, too, the SE package, mm-hmm. which includes Brembo's. And a oh. sport tune suspension. Boy, Hyundai's on a roll. Let's say idea. that. Now let's change uh, gears, actually trade in our pistons and gears for uh, something uh, very different. Yolanda, one of your um, big segments that you've been working on uh, is about a company that a couple of years ago most of us had never heard of, Fisker Automotive. Uh, they are developing a $90,000 electric car. Uh, actually, two cars, a sedan and a, a convertible. convertible. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell us, you've, gone, you've been to the plant. You've had a chance to, to meet um, the man behind uh, Fisker. I mean, what, what's your impression? Is this for real or is this Memorex? Uh, well, you know, I had the opportunity to meet Henrik Fisker at a Washington Automotive Press Association annual gala earlier this year. And he was just full of pride, just beaming like a proud papa about his vehicles and about his company. And I knew a little bit about him at the time, but I've always found him just so fascinating because he's always wanted to um, have this stellar career in automotive design. And as someone growing up in Denmark, he was told that that could never even be slightly or remotely possible. And here's someone who has developed one of the most sleekest, stylish cars, the BMW Z8 Roadster. And now he's going on to add his unique styling design to his company. We basically took a behind-the-scenes look at Fisker Automotive, which is located in like an industrial auto park, industrial park, I should say, in Irvine, California. And what I was amazed with was the whole eco-friendly, environmentally friendly theme that they're trying to tie into not only just the vehicle, but the company as well. I mean, as soon as you walk in, there's bamboo flooring that they have in the showroom, which is relatively unique. They've got these, uh, the lighting is set up in such a way that they've, they're minimizing the energy usage in the in the um, space that they have they have the 7000 square foot styling studio which is amazing. It's a state-of-the-art styling studio where they have a lot of the clay models. They have the one-third scales, the larger scales. And just the overall attitude and atmosphere of everyone there, from the designers to the clay modelers to the engineers, everybody really believes in this product. They believe in this Fisker Karma, which is the world's first luxury plug-in hybrid. Um, and and if you talk to, to Henrik Fisker, and he's quite a relaxed, cool guy to speak to, um, he says he's going to do it by outsourcing. He's outsourcing a lot of his engineering talent, uh, he's, he's outsourcing all the production. All the production is being done in Finland at Valmet Automotive, which does the Porsche Boxster and the Cayman. So he's saying that he's able to make this happen, which, by the way, he's expected to deliver this $87,000 vehicle, which is just gorgeous, by the way. The Fisker Karma, I think, is just a beautiful vehicle. You had a chance to see it at the New York Auto oh, Show. Oh, yeah. I've been, we, I saw the prototype last year in Detroit, Detroit. and we saw the, uh, the production car plus the convertible this year. But the question we've all got, those of us that have been following the company, is, you know, they were a coach builder, which meant Correct. they did custom work uh, in California. Now they're taking this giant leap. And, and while they are outsourcing all of this, and that supposedly makes it simple, the big problem is, is when you pull all the things together. You can buy lots of parts right. off the shelf, but can you actually build a car that people will buy? Now, yeah, you can probably build 10 or 100. No, he's whatever. looking to do more than that. I know he is. He's looking and to ramp up, what, 12, 1,250 a month, 15,000 cars a year is what and, he's looking to and do. And that, if he manages to pull it off with an advanced extended hybrid system. It's not unlike the Chevy Volt, where you basically run a while on electric, and then you would have a, an engine charging it. Uh, that's going to be probably the, if he pulls it off, it'll be the uh, the event of the decade. Probably. It'll be a coup de grace. Did you yes, drive it? Is, is there driving prototypes, or is this just... No, didn't get, a, didn't get a chance to drive it. It was in the styling studio. They gave us some B-roll, but no, I have not had a I'm chance not, to drive it. I don't it. think anybody in the press has gotten to drive it yet. Uh, no, not yet. I don't but, think we've but, Given that production is supposed to start, you know, before the end of 2009, that'll right. probably, they're talking about uh, driving the car either this summer or this fall. Right. But fascinating. You came away impressed. I came away impressed. You know, now it's all whether or not he'll be able to pull it off, like you said. But, I mean, you couldn't look in his eyes. And, I mean, the word no does not even exist in his vocabulary. So uh, I, I'm, I'm anxious to see what will happen. He is a fascinating guy. And it is a fascinating car. It is a beautiful car. It really is. <laughs> 
Okay, now the moment I've kind of been waiting for because we've not done this before. Uh, a lightning round. We're, we're going to basically throw out a topic, and everybody chimes in, and we've got two minutes. And Michelle uh, Parker, our producer, is sitting uh, a little bit off stage with the bell. Let's hear the bell, Michelle. There you go. When we hear that, we can sort of ignore it or we can stop, depending on how things are going. <laughs> Here's the question. In simple form, is ge if General Motors, this is all the topic right now, files for bankruptcy in the next few weeks, what impact will it have on buyers? And you can extend that and say what impact might it have on you know, sales for the rest of the year and next. This whole issue, should General Motors go bankrupt? What do you think is going to happen? Who wants to start? I'll jump in there. You know, uh, I don't know if there's going to be any buyers if people keep turning on TV and all they hear about is General Motors going into bankruptcy. I mean, you can, we can argue whether it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing in the long run for them, but people aren't going to be running out to the Chevy dealer when all they hear about is they might not be around any longer. It's kind of, kind of hard to go spend $30,000 for a vehicle like a Saturn when you hear they're going to be cast off into something called old GM, and yet they're running ads every night on, on cable. Well, I think bankruptcy is a way for GM and Chrysler to kind of clear away, you know, their old debts that are weighing them down and, and so they can get back on their feet again. I mean, this is a prime opportunity for the government and for the auto task force to deal with issues that have been sitting there for decades. And, and issues that I'm talking about are too many dealers in a declining market. You have too many brands for GM and Chrysler and high costs. So I believe that this is an opportunity for them to kind of take two steps back to hopefully take two steps forward. And in terms of consumers, this is what consumers can expect. The Obama administration from what I understand, they will guarantee warranties for both GM and Chrysler vehicles. During the bankruptcy. During the bankruptcy. So you're talking about afterwards, they could leave them high and dry. All right. I have, no, I have been, I have not been a fan of the whole plan. My attitude is that the public doesn't understand what a controlled bankruptcy guaranteed by the People government think is. just go away. When exactly. Right. Or right. they'll be so weak that they won't be here when the, when the, uh, um, uh, payments run out, and please don't tell me the government's going to guarantee the warranties because what are they going to do? Keep the parts suppliers in business when they go bankrupt? Mm -hmm. That's a good However, yeah. that's that's so. I, and never, there's never been an automotive company in modern times that survived bankruptcy. There hasn't, even back to the Depression. But we there live in is, a different time. Well, I don't think people's attitudes have changed that much. But here's the thing. Because, just as Brian said, they've been hearing it so much. So maybe it's a fait accompli. Uh, ignore the bell. So maybe it's a fait accompli. You haven't said anything, Ben. What do you think? I'm sorry. I, I agree with Brian. Um, another thing is, though, uh, part suppliers, indeed, they could um, they can have a hard time through this whole uh, GM thing. And, uh, and um, people might be scared to buy a car thinking that they might not be able to get parts for it two years, three years down the road. I don't know. You know, I only hope that I'm wrong. I hope I'm dead wrong and people will see that with the the new presidential administration behind the companies that they are going to be on firm footing. I think they will be on firm footing financially, but it all comes down to people's perceptions. And I think that GM is a company that once stood as a symbol of American capitalism. And I just beg to differ that the government and the American public will leave them out to dry in the end. I hope you're right. I guess we'll have to pay attention to it that time. All right. I think that was very good. Very good. And we, um, if you've got suggestions uh, for what we could discuss in a lightning round, uh, don't hesitate to, to send them in to us. And speaking of sending in to us, uh, if you've, uh, the website to go to is www.motorweek.org. You can also reach us through pbs.org. And uh, it turns out that a lot of the listeners to our podcast have actually been sending in some questions. So we've decided to pick one every time we do a podcast. And if you send in a question, you get selected, you get a, drum roll please, a free Motorweek t-shirt. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys, you can do better than that. <laughs> All right. It's a quite comfy one. I've got a couple. Dom from South Plainfield, New Jersey, ask, quote, I know about the mileage benefits of properly inflated tires, synthetic oil, and clean air filters, but I was wondering if there would be some mileage benefit on a 2,000-mile highway trip, for example, if the vehicle is totally cleaned and freshly waxed. Who wants to dive into that one? Ben? <laughs> what do you think? I can't imagine that it would hurt anything. A uh, slippery surface cuts cut through the wind quite nicely. Brian? 
the enjoyment factor would go up just because I had a nice looking car. I'm not sure about the mileage though. Yolanda, any thought? Uh, I leave all the car cleaning to the guys uh, over here. So. <laughs> in truth, uh, it probably right. would increase the fuel economy by about one to two percent. Just think about it: less grime for and you know better aerodynamics. So, Dom, it's it's an awfully good piece of advice. And besides, like. Brian and Ben and Yolanda indicated you'll just feel a whole lot better about your ride. So oh, I'm heading out on a big trip, Dom, if you want to come uh, hook me up. <laughs> <laughs> also, send us another uh, email. Maybe we'll send you another T-shirt if you wash my car. And don't hesitate to send in more questions by going to our, our motorweek.org or pbs.org websites. And let's see, I guess that just about wraps up uh, our Motor Week podcast number 14. I want to thank, as always, our audio engineer, Jim Bigwood, for making us sound clear as a bell. Thank you. Uh, for <laughs> thank you, Jim. Our producer, Michelle Parker, for handling the bell and making sure that we stay on track. Our podcast creator, Bob Mixter, who always is there to make that the uh, final product uh, gets out uh, clean and green. I'm John Davis. For all of us at Motor Week, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you on Motor Week. You have been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by Cars.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.